Well, let's just jump to the end of the book. I'm going to start with Revelation here. <laughs> Revelation chapter 2. Um, uh, I've been teaching on families for a long time, and so in the state of Oklahoma, they changed the laws a couple of years ago that you cannot counsel unless you're a licensed counselor with a counseling degree. Now, I have two degrees. One's not in counseling, so I was restricted from counseling. But Well, I know everybody. I've been in Tulsa for 40-something years, know so many people. Hey, Joe, can you talk to us? Hey, Joe, can we come by? Sure, sure. But I had to start talking, well, unless you can come by, but I can only give you 30 minutes legally. And so that's it, 30 minutes, clock's ticking, you come in, you got 30 minutes, you got to leave. And so I'll give you the first 15, I got the second 15. And so I don't care what you're going through, just get it out on the table. And usually it starts slow because the couple's trying to be nice and friendly and kind. But about 10 minutes into it, they get real. And the decibel level goes up and they're finger pointing and it gets the noisy. And so I let them know, and I got a little thing and I said, no, mm, time out, I get the next 15 minutes. And so I go to the same scripture every time, every time. I go to Revelation chapter two, verse four. God's talking to the church at Ephesus. Now there's seven churches in Revelation that he's talking to. Revelation got bragged on the most. God really liked Revelation, uh, Ephesians. They did the most, they're serving the most, they're giving these people. And so he's talking to them. And around verse four he says, uh, I really like you, you're really good, you're one of my favorites, but I do have this one thing against you. And they said, well, I thought you liked this. Well, I do, I love you, but I do have this one thing against you. What? He said, you've left your first love. They said, what? Yeah, you've fallen out of love with me. When we first got together, you hang out all the time, we'd sing and worship and hang out and do stuff, and volunteer. I've not seen you in a while. Now, this happens to every marriage all over America. Courtrooms are full of divorce courts. Uh, I used to take my seniors to divorce court every year for a half a day because they thought they were in love. So, okay, we're going to go to divorce court today. We've got to get permission from your parents. You're going to hear a lot of stuff that won't be nice. And so what you're going to hear today spoke between two people or two people who at one time swore their undying love to one another. I love you and I love you. Until death us do part or I kill you first. <laughs> no, that's not in there. And so kids would come back from that, and they'd, I'd have kids swap rings and break up. No, I'm not, I don't want to, no, I'm not ready to get married yet. No, no. Because they see the reality of it. And I said, listen, guys, uh, this happens everywhere around the planet. It's a choice. You've you got to choose to love. For God to love the world, he did something. He didn't feel something. He did something. Love's what you do for somebody, not what you feel for somebody. Thank you. And so I tell people, when you fall in love, with, it loves a covenant. And so... What you're looking for when you get married, you're looking for somebody. Who are you looking for? I'm looking for somebody I want to die to. What? Yeah. Because uh, it's a covenant. You can't have a covenant unless somebody dies. So a marriage ceremony is all messed up. And Hallmark's got the cards all wrong. It should say, I'm so sorry I heard you got married. <laughs> because you don't die at that ceremony, you're going to have dead zombie. Because you're looking for that one person to hold all, I got eight kids. They're all grown and married and out of the house. I told every one of them. Guys, when you get married, it's a covenant. You're trying to find the one person you want to spend the rest of your life giving your life away to. And I've told men, and our men's men, guys, you have no more say so. When you got married, you died. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to go on vacation? Honey, wherever you want to go. Where do you want to eat tonight? Wherever you want to eat. What kind of movie you want? Whatever you want to watch, sugar. My life is you. And people think you're joking. It's biblically true. And if you have that kind of marriage, that woman, gentlemen, will suck the lips off your face. <laughs> so what God told the church, you've left your first love and said, well, what, what are we doing? He said, well, you need to do three things. You need to remember from which you've fallen. So every couple, that last 15 minutes, hey, what was it like? I mean, y'all seem to be so mad, you hate each other. How did you ever get together? What? How did you ever get together? Well, we saw each other at church, went for coffee, went to lunch, went to dinner, and we fell in love. Really? What happened? Well, we fell out. What? You know, we've fallen out of love. I didn't know that was possible. I know you can fall off the couch. You can fall out of bed. <laughs> you can fall out of your truck. I didn't think you could fall out of love. Love's a choice. You don't fall out. You don't fall in. You choose to be in love. And so you need to remember what it was like when you first fell in love. So I take every couple. What was it like when you first fell in love? Well, it was wonderful when we sucked the lips off each other's face and it was so nice. <laughs> You need to remember what you felt. You need to repent that you fell out of love. God, I'm sorry. Honey, I'm sorry. I stopped loving you. And then you need to redo what you did in the beginning. You need to remember, repent, and redo. And that's how you fall back in love. So I, every couple I've ever counseled, 
and I think I've got about a 99% success rate. I had one couple that stayed stupid. <laughs> I think they had their mind, mind made up. And so the others, they realized, yes. I said, when's the last time you went on a date? When's the last time you were nice? When's the last time you gave a back rub to somebody or a foot rub, you did something, or asked, hey, can I do something for you? Because everybody's in their own world. Love's about giving your life away. That's what God did. God gave his son away with no guarantee that we would love him back. Now, that's the introduction. It's real short. It's a short sermon. Now, every story in the Bible is a relationship story. God's trying to establish a relationship with somebody. That's why Jesus, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every time somebody got saved, Every time Jesus, every time somebody committed to the Lord, the first thing, every time Jesus did a miracle, the first thing he would say was, shh, don't tell anybody. Anybody healed? Shh, don't tell anybody. Why? I'm not a billboard. This isn't a TV program. This is a one-on-one God. I did that for you. I did that for you. And so God is a one-on-one God, and that's what he likes. He likes a relationship with us. Well, what kind of relationship? Well, you got to you got to hang out with him every now and then. You know, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the throne of God, and it's an amazing sight in the throne of God. And, and you've got four angels around the throne, and they're there right now. And they have six wings with two wings to cover their face, with two wings to cover their feet, and with two wings they fly. They have eyeballs on every side of their head, really strange-looking creatures. If you go to heaven, you'll hear them say, they volley back across the throne of God saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord who was and is and is to come. Then that angel volleys back, holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty who was this this to come. And so if you went to heaven and said, God, what are these angels doing? Shut your face up, son. They're praising me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Well, how long are they going to do this? Be quiet. They're going to do it forever. They ever get a break? They don't need a break. They're angels. Shut your face up. Listen. Holy, holy. Now, God Almighty made four angels that will never do anything for eternity other than praise him. God likes praise. God loves praise. God goes where he gets praise. God does not go where he gets cussed and cursed. God inhabits praise. I tell people, you haven't felt God in a while, you've not thanked him in a while. Get your armpits up and start. It's called the sacrifice of praise because nobody ever feels like doing it. I don't feel like thanking God. That's your problem. It's not a feeling. It's just an obedience. Let's get your armpits. Well, Father, I just want to thank you for a minute. I don't know what for, but I think something good is going to come out of it. I believe you're going to work all things out to my good. Whatever mess you're in, God saw coming before your mother met your father. Amen. And he said, I've already made a way out. Right. Where's it at? Well, you've got to start thanking him, and then he'll tell you. <laughs> well, that was deep. Anyhow, I'm going where the pages are stuck together this morning. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Now, I'm going to read just a little bit, but I'm going to paraphrase most of it because I'm an old school administrator, so I taught chapel uh, 171 days a year for 10 years. And so you you got you got to have a boatload of sermons to do that. So I found the children's Bible storybook, and, uh, still in print today, uh, Ruth Eggemeyer. She was 80 years old when she wrote it, and it's incredible. And so I preached out of that. I'd read her story, and I'd read the chapter and verse, and then I'd walk in chapel, and I'd just start talking. And I would never finish. Don't ever finish. Leave them hanging. And so, okay, class is over. What, what happens? Well, we'll pick it up tomorrow. What happened? Pick it up tomorrow. Well, what, what, what? Read your own Bible. Look, look it up. And I'm just one kid. Well, where's that? What's in half an hour, chapter 2, verse 4? Look it up. Well, he came back the next day. He was a senior. Mr. Q, there's not a half an hour. That's right, son. That's how stupid you are. <laughs> Anyhow, Numbers chapter 13. Now, here's the story. Uh, they made a movie about it. Uh, the children of Israel had sinned. And uh, it had been a mess. And so uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, uh, we got Jacob and he's got a son, Joseph, and uh, the brothers didn't like him and they sold him into slavery. They were going to kill him. They sold him as a slave. Joseph goes down to Egypt, you know, and he's in prison. People lied about him. So finally he goes up and Pharaoh has a dream. Joseph interprets the dream. And so he goes from the lowest person on the planet to the second most powerful person on planet Earth in one day. Wow, I got promoted. <laughs> what are you in charge of? Everything. Pharaoh said, I'm in charge of everything. And so he had a vision of how to fix the drought that was coming, and he did. Not only did they fix the drought, but they made a lot of money out of it. <laughs> so anyhow, Joseph's down there, and finally his family comes down, and Pharaoh likes him. There were 30 Pharaohs in the history of Egypt. Incredible, incredible country. 
30 pharaohs. 27 were city pharaohs. Three were country pharaohs. Uh, you know, country boys. Well, when, when, the, when Israel went down to Egypt, you know, Joseph down there, so when they went down, that pharaoh that liked Joseph was the first of the country pharaohs. So he brought his family down, his interested family, and said, well, what do y'all do? He said, well, we're, we're sheep herders. we got some cattle. He said, hey, that's what I do. I like sheep and cattle. Tell you what, I'm going to give you the land of Goshen because it's real fertile and it's great for sheep and cattle. So the Pharaoh of Egypt gave them the best land. So they went out there, man, for three generations. It is happy time. But three generations later, the last country Pharaoh died and the secret city Pharaoh took back over. They realized, that we don't like these Jews. There's too many of them. The multiply like rabbits, they're everywhere. And so we got to do something. So they made them slaves. And they're stomping in the mud. And it's just bad. Well, Israel finally cried out to God. Oh, God, we need help. We need help. And God said, yes, you do. And so God said, I'm going to send you a deliverer. Whew, thank goodness. Well, what happened was that afternoon he had a woman get pregnant. It's in the Bible. It's a great story. Where's I deliver? Well, this couple are going to hug and kiss tonight, and she's going to get pregnant, and nine months later, he's going to pop out. He's going to be here. It's going to take a while. So, so the devil always knows. When, the devil can't read your mind. He just knows when there's a lot of increased angelic activity. So there's an increased angelic activity, and you realize something's going on. So he didn't, he didn't possess his Pharaoh, and he orders to kill every baby boy two years of age and under because he assumes Messiah's coming. He didn't know where he is. Now, God told the devil in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned, one day I'm going to come in the flesh and take this back. He told him. Where? When? He doesn't know. The devil doesn't know. He just knows he's coming. So he thought maybe, maybe besides coming here and help him out, then the Jews, so I got to kill him all. He's just been born. I kill him. So they killed every baby boy two years of age and under, all up down the Nile River. Well, Mama, Moses, you know, put him in a basket, float him down the river. Cecil B. DeMille's made a movie about it. Float him down the river. And Pharaoh's daughter can't get pregnant. You didn't know that because they didn't have tabloids back then, but she can't have a baby. <laughs> it's in the Bible. You can read it. It's a very good book. Volume two's not coming out. You, you can get volume one. It's really entertaining. And so, uh, and so she finds the baby. She says, hey, I'll tell her about this. this is my baby. Well, Moses' mother showed up. And, she, and Pharaoh said, who are you? Well, I'm a mother and I've lost my baby. I know she found one. Now, she didn't lie. But she didn't tell the truth. I lost my baby. And I said, you've got one. I said, but I can nurse your baby. My breasts are full of milk, and I can nurse that baby for you. So Pharaoh's daughter hired Moses' mother to nurse him and kept him in the house the rest of his life. And so what happened was, Israel needs to deliver. Well, God had a baby born, and the baby was raised up in Pharaoh's house, became Pharaoh's son, had the best education on the planet because God has a wacky sense of humor. So you know the whole story, Moses kills somebody when he's 40, and he runs off the wilderness, comes back when he's 80, you know, and he's got the stick that turns stuff into all kinds of stuff, and they got the plagues and the lice, and the, it's, it's nasty. So they get to the Red Sea, and then they, he lifts up the stick, Red Sea parts, they go through, they drown the Egyptian army. It's a long movie, but it's really good. <laughs> So they're through. Now they're, they're coming to the promised land. They've heard about it for 400 years. God's got a land for you because God's trying to show off to you people. He wants the world to look at you and ask about the hope that's in you. You're going to say, it's Jesus. He's trying to get attention. And so they come to the promised land. God's promised you're going to live in the houses you didn't build, eat from vineyards you didn't plant. Ooh. So they come to the promised land. Well, there's two and a half million of them. So God speaks to Moses. Here's what you need to do. I need you to send 12 spies into the land. He says, okay. So he picks one from each tribe. They get together. I want you to go into the land and say, I want you to spy it out. Find out what kind of land is it. Is it fertile? Is it bad? Is it good? Do they have walled cities? What do they have? And so go in the spies and check it out. So here's the story. It's real short, real good. So in Numbers, <clears throat> chapter 13, verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I'm giving you. Send one leader from each of the 12 tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded. Then I'm going to drop down to verse 17. So Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them to explore the land. 
Go north to the hill country. See what the land is like. Find out whether it is the people living there are strong or are they weak? Are they few? Are they many? See what kind of land they live in. Is it good? Is it bad? Do the towns have walls? Are they unprotected like open camps? Is it fertile? Is it poor? Uh, are the people there, are there many trees? Uh, uh, do your best to bring back some samples of the food. And so they're going in. So they come back and uh, if you've ever been to Israel, the, if you land in Tel Aviv, the first thing you see when you get off at the airport in that beautiful uh, the airport there, there's a statue of two men carrying a cluster of grapes, big brass statue. And so two grown men are carrying this cluster of grapes. Now I love grapes. You go to the grocery store and get grapes. These aren't grapes. These look like cantaloupes. It's one cluster of grapes the size of cantaloupes. And that's brass. You're like, what is that? Cantaloupes? No, those are grapes. What? Yeah, promised land grapes. Whoa. <laughs> And so they brought back a cluster of grapes, some figs, some pomegranates. They bring stuff back, and they're telling all the people about it. They came back, you know, four days later. What's it like? Man, it's awesome. Just like God said, big houses, big fruit, man, fertile land. Whoa. <laughs> but, but, so here comes the second part. After exploring the land, the men returned to Moses and Aaron, the whole community, and said so they reported to the whole community what they'd seen and showed them the fruit they'd taken. This was their report. We entered the land you sent us to explore. It is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large, and they're fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Malachites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Valley. But, this whole chapter is full of buts. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once. Let's take the land. We can certainly conquer it. But the other man <laughs> explored and said, no, we can't do that. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread the bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we travel through and explore will devour anybody that goes there. All the people that we saw were huge. We even saw giants, sinners of Anak. Next to them, we looked like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Well, did they ask them, hey, big boy, what do I look like? You look like a grasshopper. It must have happened because that's what they said. <laughs> hmm. Verse 1 of chapter 14. Then the whole community began to weep aloud, and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt. Oh, if only we had died in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to the country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our children will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? So they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader to take us back. We need, we need somebody to take us backward. We had one that took us forward, we don't like that. We want to go back and go back to slavery and stomp on some mud and be beat with a rod. Sounds good to me. Who wants to go? I'm not making this up. You couldn't make this up. So, so Moses and Aaron fell down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of them, and they explored the land. <laughs> Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, they, they, and Caleb, they tore their clothing. Then they said to the people, listen, the land we travel through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased, he will help us bring it safely. He will give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord, nor be afraid of the people. They are helpless prey to us. They have no protection because the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But, I'm not making this up, but the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle, and the Lord said to Moses, How long are these people going to treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me at all? I've done miraculous signs for them. You know, I've given them wisdom. Uh, I've destroyed the plague. I, I'm going to take and I'm going to kill all of them and I'll make another nation out of you. Now, that's pretty much the end of it. <laughs> so let me paraphrase the rest. God's trying to bless these people. Uh, there's another part in the Old Testament where God said, that when they went to the promised land, God took them a longer route. He didn't take them the short route. Because during the short route, there's a lot of their enemies. I can't have them encounter the enemy yet because they may turn and, turn and run back to Egypt. God's already said, I can't, get them, I can't let them get scared. They'll turn and run on me. God knows their heart. He's trying to take them one step at a time. That's why he sent their spies in and they come back. Well, here it is. 
10 gave an evil report. Two gave a good report. They all saw the same thing. They ate the same food. They slept in the same place. Two saw one thing, 10 saw another. It's been that way throughout all of history. It's a one to 10 ratio, or let's say nine to one. So I worked in the industry for 12 years, three great companies, two great church staffs. One had 3,000 people, one 12,000. And I realized, I don't care who you are, or what your education is, it takes something called faith. Do you believe God? Well, I don't know. That's not good. <laughs> Hebrews says, without faith, you cannot please God. Without faith, you cannot resist the devil. Faith's not a complicated thing. It's just simply, do you believe God? Yeah. You understand it? Nope. I've had people challenge me because we've debated people at Old Roberts University. And people ask, well, have you ever seen Jesus? No. Why well, do you know he exists? I just do. You said, so have you ever been to, the, you ever been to Israel? No. Nope. Now I've been three times. Now it didn't change anything. I just believe it. Have you seen God? No. Have you seen an angel? No. How do you know he exists? I just do. I believe it. It's a believing thing. So they came back. And they tend to have an evil report. Two have a good report. So every deal I've ever been in, it's about a one to ten ratio. Nine people think we're going under. One thinks we're going to make it. I've had companies try to close down. Man, we go through layoffs and stuff. Most, man, we're going to go broke and we're going to go under and this is the worst time and the economy's bad. The economy's always been bad. Shut your face up. It's always been bad. Would you like to get in the passing lane? You want to stay behind this semi the rest of your life. Somebody's got to break out into a passing lane. God's looking for somebody, not strong. God's looking for somebody to show himself strong in. God doesn't use smart people, if you notice that. <laughs> he uses the, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. The weak things confound the strong. God likes to show off. God's not looking for a strong person. He wants somebody to be strong through. When I was a school administrator, I collected 1,206 biographies of millionaires and billionaires in America who never finished school. Most of them never got out of elementary school, but they became millionaires and billionaires. Now I'm an educator, and I believe in it. All my kids have degrees. I've got two. That doesn't mean anything, really. Now, you need one. Get one. Do good at it. Don't cheat. Study. But it's God. It's the God factor. It's not the IQ. It's not the GPA. It's not who your mom and dad were. It's not what kind of house you live in. Do you know God? Yes, you got it made. Do You got it made. You just talk to God every day and you'll have it made. So they come back and they cry. Now here's what that happened. God told Moses, I'm going to kill every one of them. And so Moses, no, you can't do it. And that's in your Bible, I'm paraphrasing. You can't do that, God. I mean, everybody knows about you now. I mean, you shouldn't have showed off in Egypt like you did with all the plagues and stuff. Because <laughs> if you kill them now, you're going to look really stupid. Message translation, you ought to read it. <laughs> and said, you can't do that. And he says, okay. Okay, you're right. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Everybody 20 years of age and up, they're not going in. I'm putting them back in the wilderness. They'll be there for 40 years. One day for every day they were in the promised land. One year for every day, 40 days in the promised land, 40 years in the wilderness. I'll take their children in. God loves people. He's trying to bless, trying to show off. He just needs somebody that will believe him. Kids believe anything. You tell the kid there's a pink elephant in the backyard, they'll run to see it. Where's the dad? Humans eventually learn to lie because they're lied to so much. The Bible says truth sets you free. Tell the truth. Don't lie about stuff. Tell the truth. And so anyhow, they cried. They got up. So Moses told them next day, okay, that's it. You're going back to the wilderness. And they said, what? Yeah, you're going to the wilderness for 40 years. So you all drop dead. He'll take your children in. And so they got to talking. Oh, well, I didn't know that. I think we'll change our mind. We'll go. Moses said, no, you can't go. God's not going with you. You can't go where God's not at. No, we'll go. No, you don't understand. God's not going with you. And so then they decided to go in the next day, and 12,000 of them dropped dead. They came back. That wasn't good. Moses said, I told you, you can't go where God's not at. They go to the wilderness. They're there for 40 years. They come back. Now, the two that were good, Caleb and Joshua, that had the good report, they've not griped. They've not complained. They're 80-year-old men now. They come back. They're about to cross the river. And so so Caleb's having a little conversation to his buddies next to him. Now listen, guys, we cross this river. That hill up there, that's mine. Don't anybody get in front of me. I've been waiting 40 years. That's my hill. And the Bible says he outran everybody, much younger than to the top of that hill. How bad do you want something? How bad do you want your family saved? 
how bad you want your business to succeed. Well, somebody's got to learn how to fight the fight of faith. You're not fighting humans. It's believing. How do you fight the fight of it? Well, you need to feed on the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I tell, I've told my kids their whole life, read a proverb a day. If you read a proverb a day, you'll be the most intelligent person in your state. Because nobody reads this book. They carry it like it's a magic wand. And they wave it. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> no, you got to get it in you. It's the word of God in you coming out of your mouth that scares the devil, not you waving this book around. You know, I remember when I first got sick, I first got born again, I had a blanket and I got the flu. So I put my Bible forward and I was standing on my Bible, not making this up, you Christian. So I'm weaving, I'm sick, high fever. My wife told what are you doing? Preacher said, you're supposed to stand on the word. You're supposed to stand on the word. <laughs> I'm not making that up. I'm not making that up. But my heart was right. My heart was right. Now, as we leave here today, you have a great opportunity. I will say this real short. We live in the greatest time of human history. The saints that are in heaven watching us run our race, Moses, Noah, and Jephthah, they watch us run our race. What do they know? I don't know. I know they watch us run our race. You don't want to get to heaven being a thumb sucker. Can you imagine getting to the purdy gate and you get in? <laughs> and Moses goes, hey, hey, Joe, what was it like in the last days? When God's spirit was put out without measure. Well, heart. Well, your heart. And COVID hit. And got laid off. I got the one twice. My wife left me. My boss fired me. My dog bit me. So I think there are chicken leg Christians in heaven. Because every, we're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Seven years. It's going to, you don't throw bathrooms in heaven. You'll never have a bowel movement. You get to eat all the time. Seven years of eating, going to saddle your horse, come back with Jesus. It's in the Bible. It's a great story. Can you imagine going to heaven and you realize some? Um, you don't get to sit at the marriage supper because I think they've got card tables in heaven. Because every family reunion has got a card table. <laughs> Who sits at the card table? Well, the kids sit at the card table. You can't sit with the adults. You've got to sit at the card table. And you don't get a real plate. You get a paper plate. You don't get any chicken worth it. You get a little chicken leg. You're a chicken leg Christian. So I think we're going to walk around here, and you're going to see a lot of people with a chicken leg around. What a, I was a chicken leg Christian. I thumbed something all the way all the way here. I don't have a mansion, but I get to hold the door of somebody else's. <laughs> because we're laying up treasure in heaven by serving other people down here. The most powerful thing on this planet is what you're in today, the local church. Your pastor can save your life. He'll listen to you. Is he perfect? No, but he's anointed, and there's a difference. You've got to listen to the man and woman of God. They'll tell you the truth. You need somebody that loves you enough to tell you. They're not nice, but they're going to tell you the truth. If you love me, tell me the truth. We've all had people that slap, hey, you're somebody. And you realize, you're a liar. I was nothing. You know, <laughs> tell me the truth. If you love me, please tell, please tell me. Please tell me I got bad breath. And I've been in the business world. You know, I've, I've got home, and my wife said, good Lord, what have you been eating? I was watching, man, you could peel the bark off a pine tree. What have you been eating? So nobody at the lunch said anything. Dear God, they were offended. Who's going to say that? You got nasty breath. Go brush your teeth. Get them in. People got dandruff. You know, have that family. You know, you look like Mount Kilimanjaro. What gets you some head and shoulders? People that love you will tell you the truth. Please don't lie to me. If you love me, tell me the truth. The truth will set you free.